Kamran Rafiq. I'm the uh, co-founder and communications director here at the International Society for Neglected Tropical Diseases. Um, we are eight years old. We were eight years old in June, um, just, just now. And we normally have about four to five physical events every year. So this is a, a major adaptation by us in light of the COVID backdrop that we're all uh, facing worldwide. Um, and in light of that, given that the impact that COVID's having, we felt it would be a very good idea to open up this conference uh, in terms of keeping it at zero charge and getting everybody involved, getting everybody out of this lockdown mentality uh, in terms of communicating together and connecting everybody together. We've been trialing for the last 14 weeks, as many of you may have seen, uh, the IS Entity Connect um, series with my colleague Marianne Compare, who's infinitely more photogenic than myself, so I'd have to apologize in advance uh, for me, but I'll be your host today. Um, for, the, for the proceedings. We've got a packed agenda today. Um, and starting off really uh, with that, we have a session. We're very, very uh, honored to have Dr. Rajpal Yadav from the World Health Organization discussing kind of the overview of local and global vector control response. And within that, we're gonna have a little focus on dengue strategy. I'll come to that panel in a second. Um, we wanted to kind of, do this simply because of the, it's been a tumultuous year in many, many uh, respects. A lot of changes, a lot of adaptation. Uh, earlier in the year, I'm sure a lot of you know that the WHO put out their NTD uh, roadmap to 2030. Um, and within that, there are three kind of main take homes, three seismic kind of uh, paradigm shifts, uh, if you like. From the pragmatic, uh, the programming perspective, uh, there's been a move lead from process orientation to much more of an impact orientation. So really, by that, we're looking at impact to the real life uh, experiences and, and the kind of real life impact of uh, various programs. There's one change. Another one is this kind of movement from vertical silos. I guess it's the holy grail, multi-sectorial, uh, collaborative, cross-cutting approaches. Um, and that's really a, with a separate backdrop of UHC, uh, Universal Healthcare, um, as part of that change. And the third uh, change really is really looking at moving from an external, outside in kind of stakeholder led donation finance model to a much more country owned, sovereign financed um, ownership model, if you like, with its nuances and challenges as well as opportunities. So that's the kind of overall framework. What's very, very interesting to us is that obviously today is about vector control and disease surveillance. The global vector control response report, the strategy that came out in 2017 um, and leads up to 2030, um, adopted after WHA, the World Health Assembly, World Health Assembly adopted 70.16, so member states adapted. Will uh, they confirm that they're going to adapt to uh, their national vector control programs to this new kind of strategy? They all signed up to that. And part of that really uh, strengthening collaborative process, engaging, mobilizing communities, enhanced vector surveillance, uh, all of these uh, issues we felt was very, in, in many, many senses, the embryonics of the changes that you see now in the NTD uh, roadmap. And so in a way, we, we view vector control really as one of the pioneer uh, elements within the overall NTD strategy. And it's certainly evident in the fact that when you look at the case of dengue, the, the drop off uh, in vector control capacity in the 70s has resulted in dengue being one of the reasons dengue is basically spread from nine countries presenting in the 70s to over plus 120 countries as we sit here today. So vector control has a huge um, role to play and it's something we want to expand upon today and we hope that you're gonna get involved in terms of the, uh, the, the, the panel discussions. You can send in questions, everything uh, live and we'll filter those through as we go along. Um, we, uh, we, you can also 
in terms of a mild orientation of this platform, you'll see on the right side you have chat rooms. You can go into those. There's a lobby area to meet and greet people. You can dip in and out of our resource center where we've got various articles from them, some of the speakers from our own IS Entity Press Corps. Um, also, we've also uh, got the entire archive of the Financial Times um, healthcare um, weekly that comes out that's through uh, the journalist Andrew Jack, the editor there, he's, he's given us that very kindly open that up for us. Um, there's a lot going on. It's quite an immersive platform. It's our first time in this particular platform. Um, and so I suppose I have to remember to smile <laughs> and, uh, and uh, be myself as well as uh, yourself. But we, we're, we're kind of really hoping for an immersive experience um, and uh, something that we can really build upon. This particular site, we're leaving live in perpetuity after this. So we kind of envisage this as a, an area a lot of people are going to come back to, and we'll be populating it with videos um, from our Connect series that my colleague Marianne Compre uh, is in charge of, as well as our press corps uh, as we move forward. We'll be writing up these sessions. Uh, and we're looking to kind of formulate some kind of white paper, some kind of recommendation-based output from each of the panels. So we need your input. Um, it's very immersive. We are also on Twitter today. Uh, our hashtag is at ISNTD underscore press. Uh, our Twitter handle is at ISNTD underscore press. And the hashtag is simply ISNTD bytes, all lowercase, all one word. Um, I think that's been communicated on some of the, um, the, the the global communications that were put out prior to, to this. But I would really would really encourage you to 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 open your Twitter feeds as well and get involved in on that channel as well. Uh, the last thing I'm going to say before I hand over and, and start off is that um, we wanted to dedicate the ASEAN Dengue panel, which will be later this morning. And we're very uh, honored to have an update to share with you there that the Ministry of Health uh, Philippines has just confirmed that they're going to be putting their particular speaker on to that panel as well. Um, we're dedicating that panel to the late Dr. Sally Gachalian, who passed away sadly in March this year, president of the Infectious or well, the Pediatric Society for Infectious Diseases Philippines, a very uh, famous, uh, engaged, warm, um, pioneer in, in many senses of the word, well-known personality uh, within public health uh, for the Southeast Asian uh, for, for, uh, in that particular region. We had the pleasure of meeting her several times in our work in Dengue over the last few years. We were saddened by that, so we wanted to dedicate that particular session uh, to Dr. Sally, rest in peace. Um, I think without further ado, I think we're going to start and so the first session, the overview of local and global vector control response, I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Rajpal Yadav from the World Health Organization, looking at the implementation of the global vector control response. So I think a round of applause if you're there on the other side of the digital veil for, for Dr. Yadav. And uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kamaran. And let me start my first slide. Okay, can you hear and see this slide? So I will be speaking about uh, the implementation of the global vector control response. This was a, a policy strategy document that was uh, developed by the World Health Assembly in 2017. And uh, I will give you update on what has been done by WHO during the last three years. As you know that uh, over 80% world's population is at risk of at least one major vector borne disease, while about half of the population is uh, at risk from two or more diseases. So on the right side, the map shows that there are several diseases which are overlapping within a given geographical area sometimes five, six diseases in the same country or, or region. And that gives an opportunity of working in an integrated way of vector control so that uh, with minimum resources, we can get maximum benefit of tackling more than one or more diseases in the same area. We know that uh, vector control has made a lot of gains in control of major vector-borne diseases in the past. 
and some classical examples include dengue and yellow fever uh, aedes vector control in the americas during the 1950s to 60s in singapore in the 70s in cuba and uh, also onchocerciasis uh, control in the western african region and shagas control in the american region and more recently uh, between 2000 and 2015 there has been a major reduction in the incidence of malaria cases uh, globally because of three core interventions which of uh, which includes two, two vector control interventions which is insecticide treated nets and indoor residual spraying so this shows that well implemented vector control can really make uh, a lot of impact on elimination reduction and control of major vector borne diseases so considering that vector control is a potential tool the world health assembly in 2017 uh, propose this strategic document, this strategy, uh, with a vision to create a world free of uh, human suffering from vector-borne diseases, and with an aim to reduce the burden and threat of vector-borne diseases through implementation of sustainable vector control. The goals of this strategy include reduction in the mortality by at least 75% up to 2030, and reduction in the case incidence uh, by at least 60% uh, by 2030 and to prevent epidemics of vector borne diseases in all countries uh, and by the time of the end of this uh, global uh, plan. The global vector control strategy includes uh, four major pillars and these pillars include strengthening inter and intrasectoral collaboration among different partners enhancing vector surveillance and monitoring and, in, and evaluation of the interventions, scaling up uh, integrated tools and approaches based on evidence, and engaging and mobilizing communities. Other than these action pillars, we have two major foundations in this uh, uh, approach, which is to enhance vector control capacity and increase basic and applied research. This approach actually has several enabling factors and top of that is the country leadership. The major difference in this approach would be that the countries have committed in the World Health Assembly of, mobili of mobilizing more and more resources to implement vector control in order to tackle vector borne diseases in their respective countries. So, in terms of the progress, as soon as the World Health Assembly uh, adopted this strategy, then all the regional offices in WHO, which is we have six regional offices, so six regions have adopted also the regional strategic plans that are adapted or aligned with the global vector control response, or they have the, this, this strategy has been integrated in their existing action plans for vector borne disease control. And, and some of the examples on right side I, window shows that these are the actual resolutions adopted by the, those regional offices. Now, key activities that were identified in these regional resolutions include cross-border exchange of information, capacity de development, uh, better utilization of the evidence base, enhancing vector surveillance and monitoring, greater advocacy for mobilizing resources, ownership by the countries, and uh, some of the other diseases that were identified other than the key diseases of malaria, dengue, for example, are West Nile, Lyme disease, Crimean Congo hemorrhage fever, scrub typhus, and so on. The, in terms of the priority countries, uh, our regional offices uh, have been implementing some of these activities. So, for example, in the Mediterranean region, the headquarters is Cairo, vector control needs assessment have been completed in uh, several countries as a, as a bus in initial requirement to know what are the vector control needs. In Europe, they are planned. In South uh, East, East Asia, four uh, countries are planning uh, vector control needs assessment this year. Same thing, same, similarly in Africa and Western Pacific region, uh, these VCNAs either have been completed in certain target countries or are being planned. Uh, and there, there is a framework that uh, guides on how to conduct vector control needs assessment, which is available online. Uh, we have uh, also published several guiding documents on uh, implementing vector surveillance. So, for example, uh, we have just published a document on uh, vector surveillance and control at ports of entry. Manual on vector surveillance for leishmaniasis is, is under preparation. 
we have just finalized the methods and procedures for aircraft disinstruction. I think this document will go live in about two months time. And we have a plan to update several other documents that are helpful in implementing vector control in the countries. The other important aspect is that we have uh, started developing a database a, a surveillance system, which is uh, based on the national databases reported to WHO uh, through the regional offices. And there is a feedback system. The ultimate aim is that once these uh, different data on vector control are received from the countries, they will be updating the district health information system back to the countries so that the countries will then uh, start feeding this information online to WHO and will get back the feedback. And in other uh, and other sources of getting this information includes scientific publications from uh, open journals, unpublished reports shared by the partners or research trials. So idea is to build a global, a national, global and national database of uh, information on vector surveillance and monitoring and evaluation, including insecticide resistance management and even use of insecticides in different countries for vector control. We have the other uh, foundation of this GVCR in, includes research support. So we have been in the last three years implementing a multi-center study on insecticide discriminating concentrations for monitoring resistance in sand flies and mosquitoes. We have uh, between, FA, between IAEA and WHO, we have signed a MOU for uh, testing in sterile insect techniques for vector control. And, uh, and this, is, this, this map shows several research institutions, about 21 of them that are participating in the multi-center study that we are undertaking for sand flies and mosquitoes for validating discriminating concentrations. Then in terms of supporting the product evaluation, WHO in collaboration with IVCC is actually establishing several GLP sites for vector control product testing. And at least four of them, the red ones are the ones that have been already certified and others are in the process of certification. So I think by end of next year, we will have several laboratories that can provide GLP based testing of uh, vector control products for control of vector borne diseases. WHO has established in 2013 a vector control advisory group on new tools, and several of the new tools are under testing and development in collaboration and guidance of WHO. And manufacturers are bringing their database and, and getting in advice from our expert committee on how to go about trial designs and, and generating the data for. Uh, pre-qualification of these products by WHO and by the national regulatory authorities. We have uh, a, from the headquarters uh, of WHO in Geneva, we have undertaken several capacity strengthening exercises. This includes uh, regional trainings, trainings on study design for GLP based evaluation of products and on uh, actually uh, launching the DHIS2 module for, uh, for uh, data information as well as several webinars on vector surveillance and control in different regions. Uh, in terms of the update from WHO regional offices, uh, the American region, for example, has established an in, in insecticide resistance management network, and they are implementing a rollback based pilot trial. And uh, in the African region, for example, the, a roadmap has been established for, in collaboration with Africa Network for Vector Resistance. Several countries have updated their national strategic plans in line with the GBCR. And uh, the regional office in Africa has provided support to several countries on outbreak response, including the vector surveillance for arboviral diseases. In the European regions, a manual on invasive mosquito species, this is, this is shown on the right side of the screen, has been published, which is very, a very important document for prevention of invasion, surveillance and prevention of invasion of mosquito species in the European region. And a collaboration, uh, cross-border collaboration has been established between the European and Eastern Mediterranean region. And of course, uh, the EMR region has also established a insecticide resistance management network and uh, studies on invasion of Anopheles stephensi from the uh, Asian and the Mediterranean region into the African region is under study. The Southeast Asia region based in, in the headquarter, the headquarter based in New Delhi has published a new pictorial identification key for mosquitoes. 
and they have implemented several training courses on dengue vector control in Nepal and Maldives in line with GVCR. The Western Pacific region based in Manila uh, has also organized a regional program managers meeting in 2018 in which GVCR was, was also discussed and adopted. And uh, we, they have also organized regional workshops on, uh, on vector surveillance and insecticide resistance management. So some of these activities are being undertaken by the uh, regional offices. Some new activities that we are planning from WHO headquarters involving our regional offices include, for example, case studies to highlight the success stories of GVCR. Several countries have made great successes and that, does, that need to be really highlighted and advocated. We are planning to undertake vector control needs assessment in many, many more countries this year and next year. The trainings of staff in building a capacity for vector surveillance, insecticide resistance management and clinical management of dengue, for example, are planned and this is now a routine activity. As I said that we have developed a reporting system and the reporting system will be not only for the routine in entomological data, but also for insecticide resistance management and, uh, and the progress of implementing GBCR by different countries. And the regional meetings uh, that, uh, of course, this year, because of the corona problem, could not physically take place, but regions are, are really meeting virtually uh, with the countries to really promote implementation of GBCR. So that was, uh, in short, uh, the update on global vector control response uh, uh, implemented by the WHO headquarters in collaboration with our regional offices and the headquarter technical units. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity for presenting update on GVCR and we look forward to collaborating with many of you in, in our future activities. Thank you so much and over to you. Thank you very much for that, Raj Paul. Uh, to set the scene uh, in terms of the, the day, uh, especially the, the four pillars, the strengthening into collaborative research, the, the uh, in engagement and mobilization of communities, enhanced vector surveillance, which you alluded to just there, and also the, interesting the scale up of the various tool sets that are that are out there to drive innovation. Um, so thank you very, very much for that. Um, I think that's going to really get a lot of people thinking in terms of uh, how the questions they're going to send in uh, through the, the, the chat are going to be formulated. Um, and also I'd like to point out that we've actually placed a copy, a link to the copy of uh, the Global uh, Vector Control Response Report in the News tab. Uh, so anybody during the day can access that. Uh, I believe it's downloadable as well, I believe that, but it, it's there for everybody to, to see in the news tab that, that's uh, uh, part of the, uh, this virtual world that, we've kind of, that we're all in today. So I'd like to say thank you very much, a round of applause uh, for Raja. And, uh, thank, and you. Like, thank you. And I'd like to uh, move on to the next speaker. Um, we, we are very pleased uh, to be able to, to, to welcome the next speaker to the, to, to the um, to, to the meeting. Dr. Romeo Bellini, the Professor Bellini is at the Centro Agricoltural Ambiente di Giorgio Nicoli uh, School uh, in Italy and really we're going to discuss the management of Aedes albopictus in Southern Europe. Aedes aegypti uh, seems to be getting a lot of uh, attention in terms of dengue and you know uh, it seems to be the, the Asian tiger mosquito is what everybody talks about but uh, Aedes albopictus is actually very interesting because and Southern Europe is very interesting. This year we've had the autotoconus cases in Spain, in France. Uh, we had the a while, a while ago now, the Madeira outbreak, which, uh, which everybody always still talks about. We've certainly uh, tracked that and certainly covered that through our identity press corps. Um, and all of those are, are available uh, uh, actually in the news tab in the, in the resource center. So uh, that's all there. Uh, for timing purposes, I'm going to move quickly to, to Professor Bellini. So I'd like to welcome you to the floor. Round of applause again. Buongiorno. And uh, thank you for joining us. And I'll, I'll hand you over uh, to the floor. Thank you. Uh, I think you, you're on mute. Right? Uh, you're, on, you, 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 you're on mute. So you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Very pleased to be involved in this meeting. 
I cannot see my. My presentation on the screen. Should I do something? Uh, or just wait? Okay, so sorry, sorry for um, this small technological gap, but um, I, I, I'd like to uh, to talk about the experience and to share with you the experience we have uh, developed in the last 20 years on the management of Aedes albopictus in Europe. Um, and this, I think, is important. Uh, because we can uh, serve with our experience a more global uh, audience. So I accepted uh, very nicely the invitation from the association. So um, we uh, have developed some uh, experience. Cannot move the, the screen down. And this experience has been uh, has been called has, has been published already, uh, but uh, I'd like to to go through some technical um, part and technical issue that I consider to be uh, very important for for vector control people. And this is the practical management, which have been developed together with a number of country, a number of colleagues from different country, from Turkey. Spain, Germany, Italy, of course, Romania, Switzerland, Croatia, France, uh, Bulgaria, Montenegro, uh, Greece, Portugal, the Netherlands, uh, Cipro, Albania, and uh, Serbia. So this, this uh, is a kind of um, practical management plan, uh, which includes a number of um, different SOP. Uh, which is too much for a 15 minutes presentation. So I just list this SOP that you can find in the publication. Uh, first is the public health risk assessment, which is very important. This tool uh, helps mainly the authority, the local authority to evaluate uh, in their own situation uh, the um, necessity to implement uh, vector control uh, action and which kind of action and is a kind of tool to um, serve the cost benefit evaluation so not all the country has the same level of pro problem and this depends from the vector population density the the country or the, the region or the local authority should evaluate their own situation and um, decide uh, which kind of um, effort which kind of uh, investment uh, involved in this action. Monitoring biovitrop is very biovitrop is very popular and we consider important to keep the tool uh, active. Yes, certain limitation, but I don't want to go inside this technical detail. We can discuss later if you like. Uh, standard control measure in public and private areas, depending from the British uh, sorry, but very, very, very briefly, we're just being asked by people, could you possibly launch the PowerPoint so it fills the screen? It'd be easier for them to see. I apologize to interrupt you, but the slideshow, if you launch it on your screen, then that will be shared and they can see the full picture, uh, as it were. I I'm getting this feedback from the attendees. Is that okay? I'm very sorry to interrupt you, but I thought I'd just say that. Sorry. Uh... If you if you just launch the PowerPoint, uh, possibly uh, if you could possibly launch the PowerPoint, uh, so it fills your screen. Then launch the slideshow, uh, and then then it'll be easier. I'll I'll come off. Yeah.
Can you see it now? Can you see it now? Well, it says Conops on the bottom right. Just slightly go down, and there's an icon of, the, the, I think, the second icon on the right. Fourth icon, the fourth icon. If you just touch that, the fourth icon. So underneath Conops, on the, in the orange border, the fourth icon. If you touch that, it'll play the full screen and everybody can see it properly. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Thank you. It's good. Sorry, sorry. This fine now? No, no, on the right hand. Yeah, keep going on the right. Keep going. Keep that one. Yeah, if you press that. Yeah, you'd press it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. So, um, standard, uh, I was presenting standard control measure in public and private areas, of course, depend from the local situation. Mainly in Europe, uh, one of the most important um, breeding sites present in public areas uh, road drains. Road drains have to be treated by larval control, uh, insecticide, and the, the number of treatment and the kind of insecticide depend from the local situation, of course. Another point is community participation. Community participation is a weak point in our experience and uh, very delicate and difficult to achieve in terms of sufficient rate of participation. So this is um, a issue that has to be improved in order to achieve sufficient level of control. I will, let's say, focus a little bit on door-to-door -door control measure because this experience that several countries are undertaking the last uh, three, four years in order to improve the efficacy of the system. Of course, it has some limitation I will try to explain. Number six is emergency control measure in case of dengue, chikungunya, and Zika detection. So we have a public health system which is um, already sensitized to detect um, travelers coming from uh, endemic region possibly infected with the virus. So we have experience of several, uh, fortunately at the, at, the, at the moment, small outbreak of chikungunya and dengue in, in Italy, in Spain, in France, uh, in the Balkans. So it is important to keep the system very, um, very aware and uh, ready to answer. And we have also developed a quality control. Quality control is fundamental in order to keep the, the vector control activity under stimulus, under optimization pressure. And is something that is to be still uh, under understanding by the authority and has to be under the responsibility of independent uh, authority, independent from the pest control agency, pest control operation, and of course, some resistance prevention action. So let's focus a little bit on what we call door-to-door -door control in private areas. As you know, Albopictus, uh, similar to Aedes aegypti, has a capacity to develop in urban area and uh, also has the capacity to develop in private areas. So private areas are producing more mosquitoes than public area. Without uh, the capacity to intervene in private area, it is very difficult to achieve sufficient level of control. So we do usually considering the season five, six or seven treatment during the season in a public road drain. And we fix a threshold of minimum number of road drains to be treated, which at the moment in Italy, for example, is 95%. In other countries, it could be less or more, depending from the cost-benefit analysis. And together with this public intervention, we, de we do similar number of door-to-door -door intervention. Door-to-door -door intervention means ringing the bell, entering the garden, and removing uh, all source um, producing mosquito, talking with the citizen, with the inhabitant, the resident, and doing also larva control. And also here you have to fix a minimum threshold of property to be inspected. In our case is 95%, could be less, could be more. Uh, identification and reporting to the authority of people not collaborative. So very low percentage of citizen refuse the treatment. 
This has to be reported to the authority and understand the reason why and talk with these people and try to remove this option. Use of copepods in case of large water containers. SAT also is gaining a role in this activity, as has been pointed out in the previous presentation by WHO. And also we keep, a, 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 we suggest to keep a, a green line in order to have a direct control uh, with contact with the, 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 the people. In terms of efficacy, we did some work on this to try to see the efficacy of door-to-door -door, uh, using of traps. Uh, and this is a comparison, in comp this data present the comparison in, uh, with the uh, area where only public area have, have been treated. So in 2013, 14, 15, you see different area. We have a reduction which is about 40% more than only in treatment in uh, public area, which is not a big difference. We were expecting more difference in terms of door to door. And uh, we also check the efficacy with another method, which is human landing collection. And human landing collection produce a higher indication of reduction, which is about 70%. So there is a controversy in terms of indicator about uh, efficacy in terms of OVITRAP or human landing collection. And this, uh, technically, this has been proposed in terms of explanation, uh, which is the fact that uh, by removing um, breeding size, we remove the possibility for the female to lay the eggs, and so we make the hobby trap more competitive. This is the explanation, the main explanation we are we are producing in order to support the, this difference in between efficacy evaluation. We did also pools to social pools to evaluate the opinion of the resident, and we have this uh, different village in different tier. We have a about 70% of the population say that the activity is very effective or effective. 10-20% of the population say little effective or ineffective. So large majority of the citizens uh, recognize a difference in the number of mosquitoes uh, considering the door-to-door -door action. So I think that door-to-door, -door, in terms of efficacy, is uh, has been let's say showing to be very eff very effective, uh, but it has a cost, of course, which is in, in European euro about uh, between fifteen to twenty euro per year per house. Uh, he has some legal issue because in some situation. Without uh, public health emergency, uh, let's say operators are not allowed to go inside private property. So this is not a big issue, but it is a, an issue that has to be considered. And also, of course, there is the increased risk of resistance due to the fact we are covering uh, the, with the larval treatment the um, mosquito population much, so the, the resistant pressure is, is, is higher. The second issue that I would like to, to share with you is the quality control. Quality control, as I say, is very important. We do quality control on larval treatment in uh, public drain. Uh, usually, public drain are treated, uh, as you see in the picture on the, on the left, by larval treatment. Uh, usually, we have three available active ingredients uh, in Europe now, which is adapted with very polluted water that we are finding in this, in this situation. Diflubenzorum, Bectomax, or Aquatane, we, we are using one of these three. So to, to make um, efficient uh, mosquito control in public road drain, you have to have a, a census uh, in the mapping of the public road drains. Uh, so the, the, there is a need to have uh, digital instrument uh, to serve this activity uh, and the, operate, <coughs> the operator must regularly 
report on the treated road uh, with the GPS tracking system. Uh, the independent uh, agency responsible for quality control usually check about 1% of the total drain. And uh, there is, of course, uh, a SOP for doing this activity in order to have standardized data and also to report promptly to the authority, to the local authority, for penalty application. So quality control produce evidence which can be good or not. If in case the evidence show that the treatment is not being conducted properly, there is the way to apply for a penalty. And of course, this is the standard operation. We have to open the gate, uh, sampling uh, with the net, uh, checking for the presence of larvae or pupae and reporting immediately. So this is some data that I show you from 2012 in the northern Italy, in our region, Emilia Romagna region, which has a, a plan for, let's say, consolidated plan for abopictus control. And we are checking, of course, activity on the two main species that we have in, in road drain, which is albopictus together with Culex pipin. We share the breeding site, and you see the percentage of positive or negative. And this way, we were able to see in the red in the red uh, column, you see that we have some evidence of no efficacy on Culex, while in the same drain we have efficacy on Edes. And this uh, raises the question of uh, resistance, and which is the next. See the evidence of uh, good efficacy on this, and this is mainly using different bands, on which was our IGR of choice in the past. We have to change because we realize that cool has become resistant to the flu bands on. Uh, and going to the next one in order to, to be on time. Uh, this is the area where we were checking for presence of resistance population against the flu we, we found uh, at least three mutation uh, which confer resistance to the flu benzone. And these mutations are more on the eastern part of the, of the, of the region, you see while uh, in the central part of the region, we have much less uh, evidence of mutation. And this uh, obliges us to change from Diflubenzolon to Vectomax or to Aquatane, which are the two products we are using by now. To finish, I would like to stress the, the need to develop in Europe, in Southern Europe, and in, the, in general in the Mediterranean basin, a plan in order to be ready for the invasion of the Egypti. The Egypti is, considering the climatic change, at risk of invasion in the Mediterranean Basin. And uh, I think that uh, together we can try to avoid uh, the same situation that happened with Albopictus, so we can bet be better prepared and try to eliminate uh, possible invasion of Egypti as soon as possible before it invades all the Mediterranean region. So I, I, I'll be available for us with any technical question and thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Grazie uh, mille, Romeo. Venti anni fa sono lavori all'ospedale San Rafael, un project that be more with the Parkinson, so I have a very close affinity with Italy amazing to see the the effort the robust effort there in terms of the door-to-door -door, um the, the vector control activities source reduction and i think this question will definitely come up later the compliance issue in the age of covid has that had any kind of impact uh in terms of citizen compliance because at the end of the day we need these communities the community itself engaged whether that's for the disease reporting, disease surveillance, or the vector control activities. So that's a very interesting kind of uh, question that I'm sure will crop up in the uh, panel, but I'd say thank you very much again for that. Um, and that kind of brings us nicely into the uh, third uh, guest speaker for, for this opening panel. And that's, uh, I'd like to introduce you Dr. Somia Iktedar, 
um, who is actually part of, uh, who's, who's speaking from the, the government of Punjab's uh, Dengue Expert Advisory Group. She's the chairperson there um, from, and also from King Edward Medical University in Pakistan. Um, I've had the pleasure of meeting Somia in Indonesia at the Asian Dengue Summit. Um, and also, uh, we're very proud to say that uh, Dr. Iktidar is on our own dengue advisory group that we've set up as part of our World Dengue Day campaign, advocacy campaign that we're running. Um, and I'll come to that a, a bit later. It's actually on the news tab, uh, as well as well as the interview that we did with Somia um, earlier in the year. Um, very interesting, the compliance issue that Romeo brought up, um, and because I think we're, we're going to talk about a vector control activity tracking system with Somya um, in terms of an app that the uh, government of Punjab have developed. Fascinating because it's third party validated. We ourselves gave it an award um, in the uh, Science Communication Festival that we run every year at the Wellcome Trust, actually earlier in the year. So, um, I mean, Without you know stealing anybody's thunder, I think it's time to pass over to Somia. If we could bring Somia in, um, Hello, and so everyone. hi there, thank you, and, and, I'll, uh, and a round of applause, and we'll leave you. we we'll leave you to, to that. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction, uh, Mr. Rafiq. Uh, I will be talking to you today uh, from this August Forum of International Society of Neglected Tropical Diseases about the uh, Punjab Dengue Control Program. Punjab is the biggest province of Pakistan, and I will be sharing my experiences from the last year. Uh, you know, we have a little uh, lagging of the data because of the COVID situation um, going on in the country, but Alhamdulillah, we are getting better with the every passing day and the number of cases of COVID have decreased and the focus that was uh, shifted to COVID is back to Dengue now because this is the monsoon period, which is the rainy period in our part of the country. And after the rain, you know that the Dengue cases, they start coming up. So I will be sharing with you um, uh, my presentation. Uh, the presentation is going to cover uh, mostly uh, the Dengue vector control. Uh, but it is also going to give you an overview uh, of what, uh, can you see my presentation now? I saw me. I think you have to launch the presentation. And if you put your screen up, launch the PowerPoint, and then and then you'll see it. I think you, it's, it was on a different tab. If you just launch your PowerPoint and then share screen, it will come up. Thank you. Now, I think while Somia uh, loads that, uh, you can that you can always always access the interview that we did with Somia earlier in the year, as well as a very interesting connect session with Marianne that happened a few weeks ago um, on our IS Entity Connect series. Um, these technical difficulties sometimes do happen. Everything's live, and it's always um, it's always a bit. Uh, ah, there we go. We have we have lift off. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So I'll, I'll back out. Thank you. Okay. So can you share the see the presentation now? Okay, so I'm back whilst that's just being resolved. Um, it will get there in the end, don't worry. These things do do happen. Um, 
the, if you launch the presentation and then share the screen, it'll come up. Um, there might be a slight delay as well, but it, it'll come up. Um, it should be absolutely fine. Um, when you kind of, I think when you choose the share the presentation, I think you have to, do, I'm getting some kind of instruction coming to share only the app window with your presentation. I think okay. if that makes Can sense. Uh, not yet. It did, it did actually come up and then it went off before. So I don't know. It, it, yeah. There's a small lag. Because I, I can the, exactly, yeah. There might be a, a slight delay um, with that. Is is the is the PowerPoint actually open, Sonia? On yeah, may yeah, I ask it you, it's open. Okay. So now, I think if you hit share screen now once, it should work. It should actually come on. Um, you got to love technology, really. <laughs> yeah, Can there we that? go. There we go. We're there. We're there. I'm going to back out. So thank you for your patience, everybody. And thanks, Somya, for doing that live. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Can you see the slideshow? Yes, we, we can. We can see it. We can see it. Okay. Thank you. And sorry for the delay, you know, the technical errors. So we will be loving the technology soon, I'm sure, by the end of this virtual meeting. OK, so you all know that dengue has been a threat to the world for a very long time. And we all know that dengue is spread by a very small vector in the form of a mosquito, which is the Aedes mosquito. And from the times uh, of 1930s and 40s, we know that the dengue is there. Uh, but in our part of the world, the dengue actually came a bit late. But we all know that globally, the dengue has spread from only a few countries to more than 124 countries by the year 2018 and 19. And these are the figures from the last two years in which I want to highlight that during the past two years, the number of cases of dengue, especially uh, around the globe in which the countries in which the dengue is prevalent for many years has actually doubled. If you look at the figures from 2018 and you compare them with the figures of 2019, you would come to know that actually the numbers has risen to such an extent that they are up almost double the previous year. Let it be Philippines or Sri Lanka, Thailand or even Brazil or Mexico, the numbers are alarmingly high in the past year. And this holds true for Pakistan as well, in which the cases were very, very risen from the baseline, the cases that we used to have from 2015 onwards. And the numbers were alarmingly increased with a huge epidemic hitting not only the Punjab, but also our Sindh province. And today I'm going to take you along a journey of dengue in Pakistan and particularly focusing on vector control and the, the steps that we have taken to actually develop our dengue prevention and control system. If you look at this data, uh, there were only few districts with cases reported from our province in 2016. Dengue actually happened as an epidemic, which was a new kind of a disease in 2011, where we had 600,000 suspected cases. And unfortunately, we lost 375 people. So that was the time, December 2011, when we actually came to know about this new disease, dengue. And with the passage of time, we were able to adopt a system to control and monitor this disease. But again, in 2019, we had a huge outbreak in most parts of the country and in our province as well. So I'm going to take you along on a journey of the different steps that we have taken to combat this disease. Because it was a new disease and in the beginning we had limited knowledge of it. So we gained a lot of experience shared, shared by the international experts from all over the world, especially the Asia Pacific region. And we had uh, their input on the vector control side as well as the clinical side to deal with this epidemic. And that is when we had this dengue control prevention and control program of epidemics in Punjab launched. And you know that no program can be successful until you have advocacy and political commitment from the highest level. So we were fortunate enough 
that it was uh, well supported by the government and central emergency response committee and town emergency report committee response committees were formed and this is when we launched in 2012 the dengue expert advisory group this is a group of experts that have gained knowledge in different countries including asian institute of technology thailand which is who collaborating center of bangkok in thailand and as well as ministry of health sri lanka and they studied for a period of three weeks all the aspects of the dengue, including the field visits, the lab work, the clinical management, the vector control strategies. And then they returned as master trainers to our country and then they formulated the dengue expert advisory group. So some of the work that we have done, the initial, uh, you know, because there was no reporting system. So we started a reporting system by forming uh, some development of some reporting forms and designing a dengue counters for reporting of patients in the hospitals and developing some documents in the form of guidelines, which were good clinical practice guidelines, which are regularly updated. And then we started the training of our field staff, our entomologists, our physicians and doctors and lab people so that you know this knowledge can be disseminated throughout the country and we had a continuous support and um, supervision of the international experts and from world health organization so we arranged a series of activities to disseminate this knowledge and that's when we started having a program of dengue prevention and control in punjab there are some of the initiatives which are taken by the government with the help of punjab information technology board uh, and we have developed these few in the over the past few years that I'm going to share with you one by one. We, we started a Punjab health line system in 2011, then a vector surveillance system in 2012, which was followed by the dengue tracking system, which is via an application that I'm going to share. It also includes the patient reporting system and an SMS to GP response. Then we started the third party validation application in 2017. And recently we have launched an application to, to take the general practitioners in loop in the reporting system in May 2020. So the dengue tracking system is operational via an application and it is operational in all the 36 districts of Punjab. More than 40 departments, including the labor department, the irrigation department, the environment department, the health department, school education, higher education are involved in these activities. There are more than 108 million activities reported on this system with 18,000 plus Android users and they have identified different hotspots in the country where they which they regularly visit and report on this application. On the patient side, we have a reporting system in place in the hospitals in which government and private hospitals both are in loop. More than 200 government hospitals and more than 700 private hospitals they report via this system. And now we have also taken in the loop the lab labs which are doing the tests for dengue for diagnosis and more than 1,000 private labs they also report to this system. We also have a helpline and a complaint resolving system in this application. So if you look at this application, so this is a small Android application which has icons and these are the different activities with which the patients can and the, the field managers, they, you know, report. This is like an OV trap. This is an adult mosquito found somewhere. If there is water collection, if there is a tire shop, if there's a patient anywhere, if there's a larvicidal activity, if there's a cannulinous issue, if there is a water leakage issue, and so on and so forth. And all these activities are do, done in the real time and a before this activity and after performing the activity, a picture is taken and uploaded on the dashboard, which is then depicted in this form, in the form of activity and all the details are accessible to the stakeholders. These activities actually in the vector area involve the indoor surveillance, the outdoor surveillance and calculation of the Bratu index. And all these activities, they are discussed in the evening meeting, which are held sometimes daily in the, in the dengue season to review the performance of the field workers. In the patient reporting system, because you know that this disease has two parts, it is the patient and the vector. So in the, we also sometimes get information from the hospitals that the patients are coming from this particular area and wherever there is clustering of the patients from one particular area via disease, dengue patient reporting system, we can enhance our vector surveillance activities in that area. So the patient reporting system uh, gives us the information about patient's demographic, workplace and address, home address, where the patients 
can be traced and tracked and a dengue brigade or a field team goes there and does a case response. It also gives us the clinical and the lab information in patient's outcome and diagnosis. So the dengue report is generated on the basis of all this information. And this, uh, this information is then communicated to all the stakeholders, which is the advisor to health, secretary health, deputy commissioners, and the DIAG members. And this tells you and gives you an idea of the overall situation, which is sent to everybody via an SMS. If I briefly tell you how this application and the system works is that whenever you do an activity is uploaded on the dashboard, which can be viewed by the people who have an access to it in response to this, whether it is a patient reporting or a larva reporting activity, a whole system is it gets into action. So if the patient is reported, then a team goes to that area from where the patient is reported by getting the information from the system, where the patient resides, where the patient works. And they do a complete surveillance, not only at that area, but surrounding areas as well. So we have made this mechanism of 49, 49 houses that the patient, where the patient lives, one house is that 12 in the front, 12 at the back, 12 at right, and 12 at the left. So surveillance is done and corrective measures are taken. And then this case response is also recorded in the dashboard so that the patient you know, is marked as that the case response has been done. So this is the whole system that comes into place. Similarly, we also analyze that areas where vector reporting is more, where BRATU index is high, we correlate whether the patients are coming from that area in the adjoining hospitals, and then analyze our data. The data uh, gives us three types of alerts, uh, which are the, then generated by the dengue monitoring cell. The alerts are based on vectors, WHO and GIS based alerts. The vector alerts are that if your BRATU index is more than 3% in the indoors, then the vector alerts are generated. And these alerts mark the beginning of the potential dengue season. And all these alerts are sent to the respective areas for proper case management of these patients. So this is just the case response, which gives you an idea what is going on and how efficiently our system is work is totally monitored every uh, weekly or sometimes in a daily meeting in the dengue season. So if I give you a brief overview of what this application is, there is an icon, it is known as the dengue activity tracking system. You, you have a username and a password. You sign in. These are the different types of activities that you can see. They are written in our native language Urdu for easy understanding of the field force. As I told you, drainage of water, if an adult mosquito is found, if there is larvicidal activity done, if there is cleanliness activity one, if there is a patient, if there's an indoor residual spray. And sometimes we have also involved our fishery departments, which uh, to provide with the larvivorous fish in a larger ponds or collections of water which cannot be drained. So all these activities, so you, you, you do an activity, you switch on the new activity button and you save the activity. It is available free, freely on the Play Store and it is regularly updated and users just require a username and password to use this application. So it is a very simple and very easy to follow application. We have already started recently an anti-dengue third party validation to see if the activities which are done, they should, they should have an audit as well. So they are not forged or they are not bogus activities and this is continuously reviewed and then uh, the quality of the activities is also taken in control and then shared with the cabinet committee meeting which is held weekly during uh, the dengue season and chaired by the chief minister or the health minister of Punjab. This is the third application that we have launched recently, which is the anti-dengue GP patient reporting system. We realize that we do have a reporting system in place in hospitals, both private and private and public, but the GPs who are doing their clinic somehow, they are the major force which are dealing with the patients in the community and they are missing in the link. Previously, they had been reporting via an SMS if they see a patient, but we thought that it is an insufficient data and we need a data system in place for the GPs as well, so that we can time identify these patients and then mark these areas from which the patients are airy and do our vector control activities over there. So this is a new application that has recently been lost and very well appreciated by the general practitioners. 
So alert thresholds and outbreak thresholds, we are based on the WHO criteria that if there are three suspected and probable cases of dengue and a one single lab confirmed, this is an alert threshold. And if there are there is a one confirmed case and six probable and suspected cases, we call it an outbreak. We have also GIS-based alerts because if the patients are seen, uh, we mark the one kilometer area radius around them. And if there are three overlapping circles in one kilometer radius area, we see that this is a hot spot and there is something wrong in that area and the vector surveillance needs to be enhanced. We also using the SAC scan alert, which is a prediction of possible out um, outbreak depending upon the positive larva, the location and the weather data. We also use sometimes the SAC scan alerts for our vector control activities. OK, can you see there was. Can you see the presentation? Yeah, we, we, we can see it. We just went black there for a second and the sound dropped out. OK, um, so this is this is also one of the new things that we've started that we monitor all these activities, the activities which are tracked by the system. We grid them into a yellow and red and green boxes. The activities where the, the, uh, the areas where activities are lacking, we look into them where why the activities are not being over there, if they are neglected or if they they are areas without residents or there are rural population. So we just have an overview. We get these grid patterns and then have an overview. Sorry to interrupt you. Sorry, very sorry to interrupt you. The PowerPoint's dropped out. We can't see the PowerPoint for some reason. Sorry. Yeah, I just thought I'd tell you that. I apologize to it that I just stopped you mid track. But uh, it's. Uh... Can you see it now? Mm, it's something's. Yes. It's back. It's back. Thank you. Thank you. So the serverless and the monitoring system, as I told you earlier, it is the Central Emergency Response Committee, which every week is chaired by the Honorable Minister of Health or the Chief Minister of uh, Punjab. And the Secretary of Health uh, gives an overview of the situation of all the vector and the patient side to the house. And then the actions are, uh, the decisions are taken and the actions which have been taken are then reviewed in these meetings. We also publish our weekly bulletins um, about the health reporting system that we have about different diseases and special focus is given on the dengue because this has been going on in our in, in our province for many years now. We also have a health complaint management system in place so people can you know call in and say that they have. Uh, adult mosquito in their area or there is a large number of garbage or a tire shop where, where they can see mosquitoes or they can identify the breeding spots which needs to be cleaned up like um, garbage or there's a sewage blockage where mosquitoes can breed so they can actually lodge a complaint and this complaint logging is via a, a call center which is also again then um, formulated by the Punjab Information Technology Board and the complaint resolution has to be within 24 hours and this is also reviewed in the meeting. We do give importance to the mass awareness of public because we all know that dengue is a social problem rather than a medical problem and without the involvement of community we can never win this. So we have a strong social media campaign. We make robocalls to the community. SMS are, are sent out. We have a health helpline in, in which frequently asked questions are uh, dealt. We arrange walks and different kinds of activities to you know, um, provide awareness to the public at large. And social campaigns are planned and special days, uh, which are uh, dengue weeks and dengue days. And now the World Dengue Day, inshallah, we will be celebrating. So the impact of all this, because everything which is done needs to be translated into results. So the impact is that we had a large mortality in the year 2012, which is the first year. But with the help of this Punjab Dengue Prevention and Control Program, we will be we were able to bring down our mortality to very, very low rates. We had a spike year in 2017, but again, we had a 
spike here in 2019, but we were able to curtail our mortality. If you compare it with the glo global mortality, which is about 2.5% of the cases of the dengue, we are managing it to keeping it as low as 0.004%. So we recently had an international conference on dengue in 2020 to revamp our uh, prevention and control program by the input of different experts, eight different countries represented. And we were very lucky to have uh, the co-founder of ISNTD, Mr. Kamran Rafiq with us. You can see Professor Siripan, who, who is the WHO Collaborating Center Director in Bangkok. We had uh, guests from uh, Malaysia, from Indonesia, from Brazil, from Mexico, uh, from Sri Lanka, from Singapore. So they all gave us an input. We actually had seven thematic areas, including the vector control, the clinical case management, the lab management, and uh, communication strategies. And we all decided to you know, uh, get the input from all the um, these experts and add points which are missing in our SOPs. And we have published our uh, SOPs and guidelines for year 2020. And uh, we have um, disseminated them throughout the country. And we will be following them for the years. Uh, I was lucky to represent uh, Dengue Expert Advisory Group. And with the help of Punjab Information Technology Board, we have launched this Dengue Activated Tracking System application, which was awarded the best application for year 2020. I'm really thankful to IGS and TD for this honor. So these are all the different uh, people around the world who are masters of Dengue. And you can see uh, all the big names in the Dengue who have helped us in learning, uh, we, we all know that it is an ongoing learning process. And the more we connect with people, the knowledge sharing gives us a better outcome in the form of a decreased mortality and a better vector control. So this is all from my side. Thank you very much. We have this website. If you have any questions, you can write to us. We are also present on Facebook, on Insta, on Twitter. You can all connect with us. And we will be happy to collaborate on research proposals as well. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very, very much for that, Somia. We really appreciate that. Um, to see a country go from one of the worst outbreaks in dengue back in 2011, 2012, to where you are now, moving from a clinical management position for the patients all the way through to incorporating vector control and everything uh, through this amazing app is something that really deserves applause. And we were very uh, compelled, as it were, to, for, to award that to you um so thank you very much for that i'm just gonna because of timings i'm being told that because we have the following session has to start at 10 50 we only have uh it's 10 28 now i think we have to cut off at 10 45 if i'm correct so i want to move very very quickly to the last speaker for the session i say last but um uh, for me dr raman very doing from the world health organization has been a key driving force for us at the isntd actually uh, for many years now uh, with a great affinity with raman and his work um, and so i'm just going to pass you over i don't think he needs much introduction i think everybody here knows raman um, the amazing work that he's done to discuss the global strategy for dengue prevention and control to 2030. Thank you very much and a round of applause for Raman as well. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Cameron, can you hear me? Mute myself, um, but uh, yeah, we can hear you perfectly. If you launch the, the presentation, yeah, it yeah. will be perfect. Yeah, perfect. I'm going to back out now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, thank you for this great opportunity because uh, we are um, at a crucial stage of developing a new global strategy for dengue prevention and control in line with the new NTD roadmap, which Cameron had already introduced. So, basically, we need to take stock of where we are. We had a global strategy 2012 2020. We had very clear three uh, objectives to reduce deaths by 50% to reduce morbidity by at least 25% and to ascertain the true burden of the disease by 2015. So with these three objectives, frankly, the first objective on deaths, we have observed a decline and overall globally about 30% decline was observed and many countries have managed to reduce dengue deaths by very good improved case management at uh, hospital level. 
Now, in terms of the morbid morbidity, we failed. We admit that we couldn't control the number of cases because of several factors, one of which was when we launched the first uh, strategy in 2012, we were anticipating the vaccine to play a crucial role, but that has not done so far. And we hope that in the coming years, we will have more vaccine candidates playing an important role along with new vector control tools, many of which are in the pipeline. This third objective on dengue burden estimation, yes, we have achieved that. It has now become a uh, annual burden estimation from IHME and we're getting more and more requests from countries to do burden estimation. And uh, right now uh, we have uh, done burden estimation in over 18 countries and it is included in the regional plans in three WHO regions. So the real advantage of burden estimation is it helps to allocate resources. It sensitizes the decision makers at the top political level because 80% of dengue cases are asymptomatic. And if we don't count them, we are really not representing the disease properly. We need to also understand the epidemiology and the spread of the disease. And it also helps to uh, assess the economic burden in each uh, country because this is a very huge burden which nobody notices if it is not addressed properly. So WHO has this toolkit, which was published in 2018, end of 2018, and you can download it. it uh, we are happy to support countries to uh, conduct online workshops if needed right now on burden estimation. And we have been having that with uh, many countries right now. We are, we are just uh, uh, listing few more countries which are requesting for this sort of workshop. Um, just moving on. Okay, so basically dengue is a high burden disease. We accept that. Um, and 2019 in particular, we faced a very severe outbreak. And in the beginning of 2019, WHO had listed dengue among 10 diseases with potential threat of major outbreak. And in fact, it turned out to be true. And there are several factors to it because after the Zika crisis in 2016, we had a lull or in 2017 and 2018, there, there, there was a very low level of dengue. In fact, in the American region, we recorded a 70% decline in dengue cases. There are several factors attributed to it, but uh, one of which could be something to do with cross immunity. But at the same time, uh, at the height of Zika crisis, a lot of money was spent on vector control and probably we reaped some benefits out of it. But having said that, uh, we are hoping that some publications in that direction will justify it. But there was a lull, uh, and this increase in 2019 was expected, which uh, basically you all know that uh, there are uh, well-known factors with uh, rain, excess rainfall, um, humidity, unplanned urbanization, and of course, uh, increased travel. And all these favor the reproduction of the mosquito population and the virus incubation period. Now, if you really look at dengue, what has happened over the years? This is a, a stark uh, 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 diagram which, or a figure which clearly shows where are we today. In fact, since 2000, there has been an eight-fold increase in dengue cases. And in fact, my graph is not complete because if we include 2019, this will jump again further. So uh, we have updated our fact sheet where we have clearly spelled out that dengue is probably the only communicable disease which has jumped eightfold in two decades. And this uh, graph we will update as soon as we get more figures of 2019. Now, 2019, uh, this is just to give you a broad overview. We have had huge number of cases. We expect around 4 million cases to be reported to WHO by the member states. We are still gathering the data on that. But 2020 is no exception. And we are flooded with requests on how to manage dengue and COVID-19 together. 2020, we have already crossed 2 million mark and we are hardly half the year over and we, we have the monsoon season uh, coming through and more cases are expected. So this is the American region and in Asia, we, we, we still have still getting data from many countries, but there are bigger outbreaks. Cambodia is dealing with a bigger one right now, both dengue and chikungunya. 
and this is a, a major challenge. So essentially, our global strategy for 2021-2030, um, we haven't changed much from the previous one, but with slight modification, the goal remains the same, to reduce the global burden of the disease uh, with three clear objectives, to build capacity at country level to detect, prevent, and respond to outbreaks, to reduce preventable dengue deaths to zero by 2030. This is quite ambitious, but having said that, majority of the countries have got case fatality rate less than 0 0.5. So we can aim for zero and we will try to achieve it. And many experts feel it is achievable. And we have retained the third objective, which is to reduce the burden of the disease uh, at least by 25%. And this is something which we hope is doable, as I said, with the array of vaccines and vector control tools coming through the pipeline. The technical elements of this global strategy remains more or less the same diagnosis and case management, integrated surveillance and in intervention preparedness, uh, sustainable locally adapted vector control, effective and affordable vaccines, and engage and mobilize communities. And this is supported by two foundations, which is based on uh, capacity building, better program management. We are, we are really happy to see that uh, programs are being developed in countries and there is a systematic program uh, in place. We need greater advocacy from all stakeholders with strong political commitment, and we need to continue to support basic and applied research. The enabling factor still remains more or less the same, partnership resource mobilization, inter and intra-sectoral coordination, regional networks and cross-border collaboration wherever possible, effective communication, including risk communication, monitoring, evaluation, and corrective action, and translation research, in a sense, wherever we have new tools or new technologies coming through, this has to be fast-tracked through policy, operational guidelines, and regulatory support. So all these are the new enabling uh, factors. Many of them are very well aligned with the global vector control response, which Rajpal had alluded earlier. And we hope that this uh, new strategy will support uh, the NTD roadmap as a cross-cutting intervention, and it is already listed within the roadmap. So what are we doing differently? Ultimately, it is basically we want to institutionalize vector surveillance. This has to be a major part because today vectors are moving. We have places where new diseases are popping up and we need to know who is in our neighborhood. So we really need better vector surveillance. Climate change has got its own uh, role in that. And added to that, please remember water stress is coming and it is going, it's around the corner. The UN has estimated at least 40 cities will run short of water in the next five years. And uh, this impact of water stress has got direct correlation with Aedes breeding. Now, insecticide resistance monitoring and management, we need to, again, make it more streamlined. We need to utilize media for better, more effectively for communication. We need greater partnership. Um, the tracking of viruses, and as I said earlier, with the new tools coming through, we need to integrate them into our uh, vector control strategy. So in conclusion, basically, dengue is moving to a programmatic approach, and I'm really happy, and this will help in all arboviruses. Water stress and flood favors transmission. Urbanization and the threat of Aedes will increase, and we need greater regional collaboration uh, for laboratory diagnosis, vector control, and cross-border reporting. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Rama, and yet again for you know for a brilliant overview there and some very pertinent points raised. As I'm sure, as you'll see from the feedback uh, in terms of the, the the questions that are arising. Now, what we've had in the interim is that we're supposed to have a Q and A now. But the, the session is due to finish at 10.45, so that gives us about six, five, five minutes or so. Um, so what we're going to do, we had so many questions come through, all of these are going to be collated right now, and they're going to be put up onto the lobby tab. And so these we would totally encourage everybody to uh, continue this conversation. Um, what we, we are we, we're definitely going to do is in the write-up for the actual panel, um, we will be putting these questions back to the panelists 
Um, it may take a little bit of time, a week or so, two weeks, depending on their own availabilities as well. And then we're going to collate that and make a, a paper out of that and publish that onto this site as well. But in the interim, we would you know, encourage you to explore the, the, the virtual uh, site that we've got and engage with the speakers if they're available, uh, engage with each other. We are we're going to put those questions up on the lobby. Um, that That's what I wanted to kind of say on that. Um, some really interesting, uh, what's really interesting here is we're talking about global strategies uh, all the way through. We've got such a huge country spread from here. So Ahmed Awais, uh, has coming from Accra in Ghana, Elton Rogozi from the uh, from Albania. Uh, we've got Basile from Uande, uh, Cameroon, Canada. Stephen Bramia from Canada. Uh, we've got such a spread here in terms of people. Rafael Roman from uh, Brazil. Fia Cruz is on. Um, such an amazing spread of countries that this particular type of this is why we wanted to get the global uh, strategy uh, from you on that. And as you all know, there's going to be a panel later this uh, morning on exactly that, the ASEAN Ministries of Health panel. And we've got on that panel a late edition this morning, um, but we're very honoured to have the Ministry of Health Philippines join that, along with the Ministry of Health Malaysia and uh, Indonesia. So the highest disease burdens, uh, you know, of, of dengue um, are in those in those regions. So we're very happy to to do that, and I think this presentation will really set the scene. My question was going to be really, and it's an inescapable. I mean, we've got three or four minutes. In terms of COVID and the impact to all of this, it's an inescapable question. It's probably an obvious question, but I think it's it's uh, it's very pertinent. And you've seen from. Um, everybody's presentations, you know, the the, the, the management plan for Albo from uh, Roberto Bellini, um, from Sonia, the, the the app bringing everybody together. Um, from you, from from you and, and, and Raj Paul's kind of framework of the global vector response. One of the elements is community enhancement, community mobilisation, enhanced community um, engagement. How's COVID going to affect all of this, Ram? And you've got about three minutes to hit us with that. And we'll move all of this into the lobby after. You know, how will COVID affect this? Thank you, Cameron. I think uh, the answer is, uh, uh, I can give a much detailed answer, but to be very precise, uh, there, are, there was confusion in our rapid tests because both are viral diseases. There are clinical symptoms which overlap, which do overlap between the two. We had instances where a poor quality rapid test would say that you are dengue positive, though the patient may be COVID. So this sort of confusion had happened in the initial stage. So we emphasized on the need for quality rapid test, confirmation by PCR, and make sure that the patient is also tested for COVID because that is more life-threatening than dengue. That is in terms of diagnosis. In case management, our biggest challenge is we have media reports emanating from few countries saying that uh, due to lockdown, patients couldn't be taken to the hospital and few cases of dengue, severe dengue passed away, which is really sad. It is avoidable. Dengue deaths are definitely preventable and we must allow uh, our patients to be moved and maybe wherever possible, try to reduce the workload on tertiary hospital by primary health care centers, managing dengue more effectively. Uh, and so this is something which we are really encouraging. In terms of vector control, yes, vector surveillance, vector control activities are all suspended due to COVID. But what we are trying to encourage is with community involvement, clean in and around your houses and family activity. Because it's lockdown, you are stuck in the house. Here is a great opportunity. Get out, clean your house, make sure all water storing containers are covered, um, get rid of garbages which hold water. And this has to be a weekly activity. And this is what we are promoting. We have NTD guidelines on that on our website. Mm -hmm. Our uh, colleagues in American regional office has uh, elaborated this further. They have a specific guidance on dengue and COVID management. So we really need that. And then wherever the lockdown has eased, we need to slowly restore our vector control activities, focusing on the hotspot and making sure of our limited manpower to uh, focus on highly productive containers. and. Mm -hmm. uh, Bring, bring down, prevent, making greater emphasis on prevention. So I'll, I'll stop there since time is running out, but we can elaborate on this further. There yeah. are 
publications coming. I know a couple of authors who have already um, written on dengue and COVID in the American Journal of Tropical Medicine. So we will be seeing those publications soon. Thank you. Brilliant. Raman and all the panelists, thank, thank you very much for that. I'd heartily, I could, we could speak about this all day, but I would heartily uh, recommend everyone move to the lobby. We're going to have a five minute break. And I'd like to say thank you very, very much to all the panelists. Um, wonderful first session. It's really set the tone for the rest of the day. And there's so much to unpack, not just the strategy, but how are we going to get to this, these endpoints? Uh, you know, the, 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 how are we going to do this? That, I think, is the next stage of the, the conversation. Um, and I, so I think I would really, you know, like to give a round of applause to everybody um, involved in that, as well as the uh, attendees as well for, for patients and, and, and being engaged. Um, I'm going to back out now. I think we've got a five minute break and then we're going to be straight back with the genomics and proteomics um, panel. Um, so thanks a lot. And I think you have to click on the, uh, on the other talk. So I'll, I'll, I'll see you in about five minutes or so from now. Please hit the lobby. Start, you know, it's all there for you. There's a new center with resources in there, everything. Thank you very, very much.